So first this speaker is Dr. Manmohan Singh sir, uh, well known to everyone. Uh, he doesn't need any introduction. He's been uh, the faculty of PMC Neurosurgery for more than 20 years now. The neurosurgeon par excellence. Uh, brilliant teacher and never all a wonderful human being. I have been really fortunate to have uh, got the opportunity to be trained under him. And uh, he was like, we could go to him for anything, whether it is theory, clinical, surgical, decision making, or for that matter, even resident related problems. So, sir was like a one stop solution to all the problems. So, we are really honored to have you here, sir. So, sir has special interest in vascular skull veins and also. also handles gamma knife and uh, uh, EMS neurosurgery. So, talk to you, sir. So, I'll be discussing uh, cavernous sinus. So, I know that this is a little uh, difficult task to explain and teach uh, and discuss with all the colleagues in a matter of maybe less than an hour. So, let me see that how can I do the justice. So, so it has got cavernous sinus as we all know from our anatomy days in the first year MBBS that it is definitely a very complex structure anatomy and uh, lying deep uh, into the skull base and uh, it is complex why because of its uh, difficult locations, osseous relations, a lot of uh, bony relations are there, anterior, medial, inferior, posterior and there are a lot of dural reflections uh, in and around the cavernous sinus. So that also makes it difficult to identify sometimes during surgery. And uh, it has got very important neurovascular structures which includes the major blood vessels of the brain which is the internal carotid arteries and all nerves. Um, creating of third, fourth, V1 uh, uh, divisions and six nerves. So they are in and around the cavernous sinus and there are a lot of venous tributaries and its drainage. So, if you see that these are the challenges, you see that uh, challenges, you know, you see that the first image, this is the cavernous sinus uh, hemangioma. So, this is, then another thing is again the cavernous sinus hemangioma which is extending into the cella. Okay? And there is uh, Peter Schaeffer's chondrosarcoma which is actually into the cavernous sinus. So, this is the meningiomas which is there into the petroclival region and extending into the cavernous sinus, a very giant uh, chondrosarcoma and uh, other uh, problems are there which are actually sometimes need surgical exploration through the cavernous sinus like this is a uh, multi-compartmental giant uh, craniofrangioma. So, how do we manage them? So, we all know that there are various ways to manage these cavernous sinus lesions that may be conservative, medical, radiosurgical or the surgical. So, when do we need a conservative management of a cavernous sinus lesion? Actually, when they are meant incidental and infection. So, in those situations, you may have to follow them up as per the patient's uh, condition or if uh, the patient is willing for a regular follow-up, so they may be a, a follow-up. So, there are many cavernous sinus pathologies which are actually of medical alien origins. What are these? That like the fungal infections which are extending into the cavernous sinus through the uh, paradisal sinuses. Aspergillus and mucormycosis which is there in the cavernous sinus, they need medical therapy, not surgical therapy or any other radiosurgical therapy. So then, this is the prolactinomas. Initially, we thought that we can treat it by surgery, but it is not the reason that it responds very well to the medical therapies, that is the bromocryptin or the cabergoline. Uh, gamma knife radio surgery is a treatment of choice of majority of the cavernous sinus lesions. So, it is an established entity in itself and the standard of care now for majority of the lesions. And, uh, but for that, we need to select uh, suitable patients and it is non-invasive, it is outpatient procedure and it is minimum morbidity. Patient is admitted in the morning and by evening patient is discharged and very excellent uh, follow up uh, is there without any uh, morbidity in the long term. And uh, effective across the pathologies, be it uh, schonoma, be it cavernous sinus hemangiomas, be it uh, uh, other pathologies like uh, meningiomas, even the uh, pituitary adenomas, they all respond to the various doses of uh, uh, gamma knife. So, uh, but thing is that uh, we need to select them carefully that the, only the small to moderate sized tumors can be treated because uh, radio surgery has its limits for its volume. So, the larger the volume, the it may be effective but the side effects of the radiation to the adjacent neurovascular structure is high. 
So that if we select a larger tumor, the dose will spread to the normal brain and can lead to the radiation toxicity and sometimes necrosis of the normal brain also. So large tumors with the mass effects is uh, a problem because uh, gamma knife is going to take time. Uh, most of the time it takes around 6 months to around 2 to 3 years to have its full efficacy. So that tumors which are causing a mass effect, midline shaped herniations, they are not the suitable uh, pathologies to treat with gamma knife. And uh, we, another thing is that we need to differentiate uh, inflammatory pathologies uh, radiologically before we subject them for uh, gamma knife because that is not a, a treatable scenarios for uh, radiation but they require other medical therapies. Uh, this is a case of uh, cavernous sinus meningiomas, so given gamma knife and over a period of time you can say that it doesn't disappear but they shrink in size and stays there, it doesn't, they do not grow in size over a period of time. And uh, many times the cranial neuropathies usually they present with six palsies or rarely with maybe with the third palsies also. Many times these palsies reverse over a period of time. And uh, because the mass effect is there, the stretch and uh, compression on the nerve, it actually goes over a period of time and they act, these neuropathies many times they recover. So again a case and uh, you said that a significant reduction and this is likely to be followed up over a period of time and uh, these tumors, the residual tumors, they are static in time over a period of time. So again, a pituitary adenoma, you all know that this is a now a standard of care to give uh, adjuvant uh, stereotactic radio surgery to all residual tumors in the cella or into the cavernous sinus. So it is now a standard of care across the world now. So if there is a tumor residual, they are likely to grow over a period of time. So it is better to treat them upfront rather than to let them grow. So that once if they grow inside some it, they may be touching the uh, optic pathways or the optic nerve chiasm so that the radio surgery becomes difficult because it has the toxicity effects on the uh, visual pathways. So the tumor which is away from the visual pathways, small in size, they are the actual very good, can those patients are actual good candidates for radio surgery. Uh, this is the 6 nerve schwannoma, 5th nerve schwannoma, given radio surgery, they practically, the 6 nerve schwannoma practically melted away and the 5th nerve schwannoma has significantly reduced in size and this residual size is likely to stay. So many times so these patients go to the people, those who are not conversant with the radio surgery, they feel that the tumor has not disappeared and probably may require a surgery or something like that. But actually these tumors, they shrink in size and they will stay forever. So they are unlikely to grow, but definitely they require a follow-up. Very few small percentage of patients may have a breakthrough and they can grow. That happens usually in case of meningioma, but not in cases of uh, schwannomas. But this is not uh, uh, gospel truth, but things can go wrong. So they require regular follow-up. Uh, this is the hemangioma. So hemangioma is one thing which uh, a small, medium-sized hemangiomas so they are not a surgical candidates. Gamma knife or any other form of radio surgery, I would tell you that they are, that is the standard of care. These hemangiomas, they practically melt away uh, with the radio surgery. And sometimes we are very difficult. So for example, a patient comes to you with the cavernous sinus lesion, we are thinking whether it is a meningioma or it is a schwannoma or it is a, maybe a cavernous sinus hemangioma. If there is a diagnostic dilemma, so the treatment is more or less similar for all that because we are not going to operate them, we give subject them for radio surgery. So this lesion will melt away or significantly reduce in size within 6 months. So which is not going to be the case in meningiomas or in case of shawarma. Then it becomes diagnostic that probably this is not there, probably this is a meningioma. So they practically significantly shrink in size in a short period of time and very good results. So uh, I would say that uh, with this uh, uh, statement that small uh, meningiomas, they are not a candidate for uh, surgery. They should always be subjected for uh, radio surgery. So again, a, a, a meningioma and uh, this is the post uh, radio surgery. So it has significantly reduced, practically disappeared on the uh, right side and the patient has very good uh, uh, ocular movements in post treatment. So surgery, we always think that this is a very difficult thing. Uh, very few people can actually operate and the long term effect may be a difficult, lot of morbidity and sometimes mortality may be there. But I can tell you that this is one surgery or one area 
which can be learned with no not much difficulty and uh, they have very good uh, post operative results because this is extradural surgery you are not going to touch the brain and uh, only thing is that you need a good uh, knowledge of anatomy and uh, maybe a uh, uh, cadaver dissections a uh, good knowledge about the lesions and correlation with the radiology so if you can do these things the cavernous sinus, sinus surgeries are not difficult and these patients they actually do well because you are not touching brain at all and extradural and the only thing which you have to be careful is regarding the extraocular movement the nerves so which need to be carefully dissected and you need to develop corridor for that and you need to be concentrated on the lesion itself so that you are not creating new keratin neuropathies but I can tell you that many times these neuropathy do develop because of little bit of handling but by and large these are very reversible and they recover unless you have cut them or significantly damaged them. Uh, surgical corridors we all know that this is a very uh, peculiar picture everybody must have gone through it. So there are lot of triangles through these uh, nerves which uh, I will not be discussing but thing is probably you all know that and uh, is the anterometer knowledge triangle, the Hoover's triangle, Parkinson's triangles. So I think uh, it's not a very difficult to learn also but thing is that this anatomy has to be imprinted on your mind that this is the way that cavernous sinus is there and actually these are the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus and the cavernous sinus per se is a very potential space which is a venous channel containing uh, only that internal carotid artery and on the inferior aspect there is six nerves. There is nothing else in the cavernous sinus, rest everything is on the lateral wall. So that anatomy we have to be very conversant with. So uh, the lesions which are there on the anterior and medial, anterior medial and posterior medial. You see that anterior medial and the posterior medial lesions which are there on the cavernous sinus, they are have they need only intradural exposures. So uh, the typical examples are like the clenoidal meningiomas, the petrous apex meningiomas, which are there, they are extending into that. They are not laterally extending. They may just require a little bit exploration of the cavernous sinus medially, and uh, then you can go and excise them. So lesions which are anterior lateral and the posterior lateral, right? So they require purely extradural uh, exposures. So lesions which are involving all quadrants of the cavernous sinus. So they require combined intradural and extradural approaches. So surgery, if we consider surgery as the treatment modality for the cavernous sinus, so first our diagnosis has to be correct. What we are operating? Are we not operating any inflammatory pathologies which requires totally a different way of treating them? For example, are we not treating something which has the other easy way of managing like radio surgery? So that way we have to have a correct diagnosis. So imaging has to be very good with all sort of imaging sequences of MRI have to be there so that we have to come to the correct diagnosis. So uh, good patient selection is required and uh, appropriate surgical approach which way you have to approach that cavernous sinus region is important.